Welcome to The Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. Each week we investigate themes of leadership, entrepreneurship, and mindset with some of the greatest minds in real estate. And now, the data scientist of real estate, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Scott Grojan, founder and CEO of Silverback. Scott has extensive experience implementing cost reduction recommendations for clients with multi-location entities and diverse corporate cultures. Welcome to the show, Scott. George, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate you right, having well, me on today. Yeah, well, hey, I'm, uh, I appreciate the fact that you were able to come down today because I think that cost reduction is a huge thing, as we know, in multifamily and commercial real estate, which is where I'd like to focus today. Uh, it's a huge thing. Obviously, that impacts not only the bottom line, but also your exit multiples. And I think that's a it's a service that I think a lot of people are not really aware of. I think a lot of people are aware of things like cost segregation and things like that. But how many people have actually called a cost reduction expert into the mix? And uh, so I guess with that, uh, I'd like to hear about some of the people you help. So I know it's not just multifamily and commercial real estate and construction, which is what I focus on. But uh, tell us about some of the other people you're able to help. Yeah, George. Again, thanks. Appreciate you having us on. So we look at anything an organization spends money on other than labor. So anything other than human body, and we do that all on a straight contingency of savings. We have clients in almost every different industry. Um, we do a lot of healthcare, we do a lot of manufacturing, um, but we have school districts as clients. Um, we have distribution companies. You name it, we have it, and we've done it over the years. So it's a it's a great business. I think everyone in the world should do cost reduction work, um, and it actually, George, it I. I've been using this new term now. I call it profit enhancement. Sometimes our work actually bleeds over on the revenue side, and that's a great way to in, improve the uh, improve the profit of the organization. Right, love it. Uh, top line, bottom line, it all counts. And uh, let's start with one that actually, before we go into the specific examples, I know one of the, your mo is you send out somebody who is specifically trained in that industry, right? So. Not to worry the fact that you work with school districts and car dealerships and everything else. You, when you go out and do real estate, my understanding is you send somebody who's who's focused on cutting costs in that field, correct? Yeah. So we use what we call subject matter experts. Um, so, for example, if we're looking at the trash bills on a uh, multifamily housing or whatever, we use an expert from the trash industry. So his experience is... 20 plus years in the trash business and he knows a trash bill inside and out and he knows all the tips and tricks. Right, right. I'm glad you're starting with the utilities because people think of utilities like, oh yeah, it's the government. You can't fight city hall. It's all regulated and, and you know, but, but you actually do. Absolutely. We do it day in and day out. And uh, actually it's one of our, our favorite areas to work on. Every, like you said, everybody has these bills and they, they think it's just a cost of doing business. And, and it's a great way to relationship build with a client as to save them money on their utilities. Right. And then I think probably one of the biggest worries with people in any business, uh, real estate included, is that, wow, I've got my vendors. And it's like, well, you know, if this guy comes in and he makes me switch vendors, you know, that's not good. Yeah. George, the interesting thing about our work is is 70 percent of the time our client stays with the same vendor before and after. They just write a smaller check. Exactly. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. And then as I understand also that when you work with people, if I say like, man, I like everything about the way my apartment runs, but I just don't like the trash bill or I don't like the telecom, you, you know, you, you're willing to do that, you know, piecemeal too, right? You don't necessarily have to go and attack the whole monster if we just say that I'm just looking to to cut costs, you know, hey, over here. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. We'll look at any expense on an a la carte basis. You know, whatever it is, if you have an interest in us looking at it, we're happy to do it. And, and frankly, George, even our recommendations we give are a la carte. 
So we may look at, at trash for a company or an organization and it involves some, you know, maybe doorstep trash collection and uh, the regular waste. Uh, and they say, hey, we want to do the doorstep, but we don't want to do the, the, the trash that's hauled away. Um, and we're good with that. So whatever it is that they have an appetite for, we have an appetite for. Yeah. And at this point, I think there are probably a lot of people who think, you know, this is great. You know, we're going to enhance the revenues at, at our place, cut the costs, uh, maybe get some additional top line too. And that's going to shoot up the NOI. But I think the real question at this point is then, well, what does it take to work with you? I mean, what if you have like, say, 10 units, 50 units, 100 units, 200, where, where would you start working with people? Um, generally, I would say as a, as a really large or as a, as a rule of thumb, the larger, the better. Mm -hmm. It's probably 200 units and up yeah. across the portfolio. You know, we've done We've worked with organizations that have, you know, two and 300 units, and we've worked with organizations that have tens of thousands of units. Size doesn't matter. Certainly, the larger the organization, the more opportunity there is, but, but we're good with um, probably 200 and above. Does that have to be in one localized geography? No. You can have, if you have 50 here and 50 there and 100 here, that's all good with us. Um, just as long as there's enough uh, meat on the bone, so to speak, to pick on. Exactly. So we just scan our bills, send them in, or you come out and scan them, essentially, and just get the process started. Yeah, exactly. So we um, we have a couple of kind of key cornerstones of our work, if you will, George. Uh, first, obviously, we want to save the client money because that's how we uh, that's what we're known for. That's how we get paid. Um, the second piece of that is we'll do all of the work that the client allows us to do. Um, so sometimes the client, as you mentioned, scans the bills to us and sends them to us. Sometimes we run into folks that say, hey, like we're super busy. I don't have time to pull the bills and we'll send someone on site, literally pull the bills out of the file cabinet or download them if they store them electronically and we'll start the process that way. Great, great. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that I love, I watch your other interviews, you talk about working with small businesses and a lot of these, like say a laundromat or something like that, a uh, car dealership, who knows, uh, may sell for say a 5X earnings multiple. But, you know, and that's cool because if you think about it, right, if I pay you and uh, okay, I think we're going to have to get into how exactly you get paid. So it's contingency, right? So if you don't find anything, uh, you know, there, there's no charge. So we're going to have to deduct something from this in a minute. I'll let you explain that. But that's like, wow, you know, I save $1 per year and that adds $5 then to my exit multiple. But these apartments, for example, they're going at a much higher multiples. I mean, we talk about cap rate, but you can convert the two. So obviously, see, there's there's a huge option here. I mean, you might be able to sell, you know, 15 or 20 times uh, your, your NOI here in real estate. So, okay. So I'll, I'll let you have at it right there. So what, yeah. what are the, uh, the value of doing this for uh, real estate? And then, then how do you get paid? Yeah, George. So our fee is one half of savings. So we're equal partners with a client mm -hmm. and we, we share that savings for a period of 36 months. And yeah. then at the end of 36 months, generally our guidance to the client is go on your own and enjoy a hundred percent of it. And I think it's a great investment, you know, to your point, if we, if we save an organization a hundred thousand dollars a year, um, they're going to pay us 150,000 over the three years, right? They're going to also save 150,000 over the three years. And then if they go to sell in five years, they end up with uh, one, what 1.5 million at a 15 X. Right, exactly. And so then uh, to do a little more math, you could call that that's the same as one and a half one year savings, but because you're taking it out over the 36 months, then you should expect to see that you could get half the benefit immediately. Right, exactly. And we build that, George, just to give you perspective, we build that line by line, item by item. We put all of the lines of the invoice in our analysis and we just share the, the total bucket. And so once in a while, uh, we run into a scenario where our program actually costs some money. So for example, maybe we did a project on their office supplies and they were buying a box of paper clips and maybe they were paying $2 for the box. And on the program that we set them up on, they pay two fifty, dollars right? So every time they buy a box of paper clips, it costs them 50 cents. We put that 50 cents in the same bucket 
as the savings, and then we we total the bucket and share the bucket. So it's true bottom line savings. Right. So you totally net it out. And then I know that you don't just let people sink or swim. So it's not like you come in, do the study, and then you get billed for 36 months. My understanding is that you do get some ongoing, I think it's monthly meetings. Is that is that how it goes or what? Yeah. So, so we do a monthly audit. Um, we do that for several purposes. One, we want to make sure that we're generating the savings that we thought we were, right? Or the right. clients getting the savings we, we expected. We also do. As part of that audit, that's how we calculate savings, so we know how much to to invoice the client for. And the third person or third reason that we do that is that we're looking for other uh, things that are happening in their business as the ways to save them money, right? Maybe, for example, we do a project on their trash, and we have a you know a dumpster there, and over time occupancy's increased and all of a sudden now the dumpster, you know, the dumpster's picked up three days a week now. And then all of a sudden we start to see an overage charge. Hey, maybe we need to go to four days a week. So we're looking at that invoice. We're seeing what's going on. Conversely, um, you know, maybe they're picked up three days a week and the dumpster isn't always full and we roll it back to two days a week. So we're, we look at that invoice every month and look for opportunities to save them money and then bring that back to the client and see if they want to do it. I love the dumpster example because being in construction, I know that that's just one of those charges that you you have to deal with. If it's overfilled, it's no fun. So tell us, what are some of the things you can do? You can have it picked up more often. Anything else you can do for that? Yeah, so so on the on the trash side, the keys to it is, are making sure that the dumpster is like almost full. We don't want it overfilled <laughs> and we don't want it underfilled, right? We want it almost full. So so optimizing the size of the dumpster, the frequency of the pickup, right? Those are the, the key components of that. And then it's also, um, are there opportunities to, you know, use a trash compactor. Sometimes right. it makes sense to, to put a compactor in there and then you have less hauls over the, the course of a month or whatever it is. When you have a compactor in there, then you get into, and this is really interesting. And, and frankly, I didn't know about it until I started talking with our waste guys. You know, that, that compactor has a, a hydraulic arm in it, right? That compacts the trash down and just pushes it down. Over time, that hydraulic system loses its effectiveness. So it, it compacts it less. Now it doesn't happen overnight and you don't see that in your bill month to month, but when you map out the data over a long period of time, maybe a year or two years, you might start to see that compactor not compacting as well and you end up pulling a full load, but it's a lighter load. Right. Um, and then in that scenario, you have the, the hydraulics rebuilt, and then you get back to a, to a heavier load. So there's all kinds of things that go into that, and it, and it just, it's very detailed work. Yeah, it's exciting. And I know even people, of course, everybody thinks, well, hey, I know my craft. I, you know, I, I know how to cut the cost here. But then you guys are, you're doing this all day long. You have some innovative ideas that I think most people wouldn't think of. Now, I'm wondering, do you have any stories or anecdotes that you can tell on the air from, say, construction, uh, commercial, or multifamily real estate that, that you haven't told before? Because I, I think these are just really instructive to just think about just how creative it can get uh, with, with these cost savings. Um, you know, George, it, a lot of times, again, it goes back to, to right-sizing the dumpster but, but maybe it's already been right-sized. Maybe it's all perfect, and sure. we just have to write a smaller check. It's not uncommon for us to come in. They've got the right-sized dumpster. They've got the right-sized frequency or the right frequency on the pickup, and it's then simply a matter of negotiating the charge down. One of my favorite savings is there is cash in your trash. Right. Go out, look in the dumpster, and if you see cash, you should dig it out. Right, right. If you don't see cash in your dumpster, you should call us because it's in there. You just don't know it. <laughs> well, I've, I've done a few scrap runs in my life, so I think I know what you're talking about. But that that may only be one of many things that you can do. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's always opportunity to um, in the telecom space, right? 
How many phone lines do you have? What kind of internet connections do you have? You know, many times we see in the, you know, in the, the weight room or the exercise area, they have a TV. There's generally opportunity to save money on the TV. There's opportunity to save money. You know, everybody has to do an annual inspection on their fire alarm. What's a, what's a good price on an annual inspection on a fire alarm? Right. Well, you might know that across your portfolio, but you don't know it across hundreds of different apartment communities. And that's the data that we have. And that's the yeah. data that's, that's different uh, that we use to help, help our clients save money. So on the waste stream, you know, there's many communities out there that are doing uh, doorstep trash collection or the, the kind of valet trash where they go around and collect it at the door. It can be an awesome source of revenue for the community. So it has a lot of benefit to the community. Generally, the community's cleaner. The, the trash then always ends up in the dumpster instead of next to it. Sometimes it ends up next to the dumpster, right? So you end up with a cleaner community. And it's a great source of revenue for the community, for the owner. Um, the other thing that's out there that's kind of different is there's some ways that you can um, generate revenue from a renter's insurance standpoint. Yes. Right. So you can you can set up a captive where the where you own an insurance company and then, you know, you require the tenant to have renter's insurance. And, and generally speaking, the claims on renter's insurance are pretty small. Right. They're not very often. Um, and if they are, uh, they're not generally large claims. You can set up reinsurance above a claim amount so that you're not in it alone if there is a large claim, but it's a great way to generate income for the property and also meet uh, the tenant's needs. That's great. So yeah, now I see where you're headed with profit enhancement. You help people find new streams of income. You did mention the valet trash. Uh, like here's another one. You can put up cell phone towers. I mean, it's almost yep. limitless the number of potential revenue streams that, that you can uh, set up. So I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, just one of those new revenue streams can be extraordinary. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Okay. So at this point, there's all these exciting advantages of working with you, but are there any drawbacks? Like, for example, I imagine you probably run into people with this sort of DIY mentality, you know, Hey, like I, Hey, I know my business. Uh, what, what do you think you're doing? Yeah, we do run into that, George. Um, the analogy that I always use is you're generally not going to do your own tax return. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to do your own tax return because you don't want to pay any more tax than you absolutely <laughs> positively have to, right? No. <laughs> that same logic holds, holds true in our business. We do this work day in and day out. We do it all across the country. We do it in all different industries. And you're absolutely going to save more working right. with an expert than a, kind of a DIY approach, if you will. Right. And then what about getting the team ready? So it might have some holdbacks on the team. What, do you, what would you recommend to make sure that that doesn't uh, throw a monkey wrench into the works? Yeah. Sometimes, George, it can be polarizing when we're brought into an organization. Um, you know, there, there may be someone that owns that category or is responsible for that category. They, they out of the gate, they may not be enamored with us being hired, frankly. Um, in the end, they're going to love us and we're going to make their job so much easier. Um, but out of the gate, it's not really a warm reception. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, one, one of the things we do on an ongoing basis is if we're managing if we did a project on their trash or their utilities or whatever, we manage that all the way through the end. So today the, the trash carrier doesn't show up to, to make the pickup, you call Silverback and Silverback will resolve that for you. So it's a one shop, one call, one shop stop to get it all resolved, which makes it a lot easier for the day-to-day -day property manager. You yeah, one more question about the piecemeal approach. So I imagine like, Suppose you like the insurance that you got. You guys look into it, say, hey, we can save a little money here. But you say, like, ah, I just feel like this coverage is a little better. So you you can kind of work with the client there, right? And you can they, they can kind of veto things and say, like, well, hey, I don't like that vendor, or I like to just kind of stay where we're at or this the current approach, correct? Yeah, absolutely, George. And I would tell you this: the cheapest is not always best. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, we're we're in this to save money. 
for our yeah. clients, but we're only as good as our last recommendation. And it would not be uncommon for us, George, to recommend a vendor that's not the cheapest. You know, if we've worked with vendor A and vendor B, and vendor B is cheaper, but we also know that vendor A is going to give them better service and be more responsive in the end, we're always going to go with vendor A because we want to make sure our client's happy and saving some money. Okay, so then we talked about some of the more, um, maybe the sexier things like utilities are really expensive and insurance is, well, especially if you're in Florida, which I am, uh, <laughs> issue. Uh, but what about some of the more mundane things? What, where are some other uh, cost streams where you can make things better? Yeah, George, again, go, it goes back to anything they spend money on other than a human body. Um, it can be run-of-the-mill stuff like office supplies, janitorial yeah. supplies. It can be copiers. We've done work. You know, some of the apartment communities end up with kind of a business center, and they have a copier in each of those centers. It can be the copier and the lease on the copier or the purchase of the copier. We've even done projects on some of the kind of refurbishing supplies, if you will, paint, carpet, all those things, right? Uh, sometimes they may be buying that individually at the property, and there's opportunity to leverage that across the portfolio. Really, anything they spend money on other than labor. Yeah, good to know. Good to know. Well, how about this? Before we head into our rapid fire round, I'd like to turn around and ask you, is there anything you'd like to ask me? George, tell me one thing that if, if you knew then what you know now, what would that be? So so earlier in my career, I would just, if I could have known that things would turn out okay, just understand it's going to be all right. Enjoy the ride. I think a lot of people who are driven, who I'd have to imagine people listening to an entrepreneurship podcast probably are, uh, be a little too hard on yourself. So yeah, you know, be hard on yourself, bro, but realize that, you know, if you put in the work and you're really willing to take the feedback, then you're going to see the results. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. Awesome. Thanks, George. All right. So now let's let's head into the uh, the rapid fire portion of the interview. Scott, are you ready? I, I've got my helmet on. I'm ready to go. All right. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> If you could be known for only one thing, what would that be? Innovative ways to help people achieve their financial goals. If you could define one greatest lesson that you've learned as an entrepreneur, what would that be? Hire people that are smarter than you and surround yourself with them. What personal characteristic has been most pivotal your success? Perseverance. All right. Awesome. Now, now we're going to mix it up a little bit here. I got my random question cards. Just tell me when to stop cutting the deck. Go ahead. Right there. I like that one. All right. All right. Guard. Oh, shoot. This, this, what's your dream job? I like, get rid of that one. We got to, you're doing your dream job. You're living, living the dream. Okay. Would you rather visit a big city or the countryside? The countryside, George. I grew up in uh, South Dakota in a rural area, and I love the country. Yeah, I just think that's beautiful. I think, you know, cities, they're all pretty much alike, but there's so much beauty in the world to be seen. <laughs> Absolutely. Name a book that's helped afford you as a leader and as an entrepreneur, and why? So I'm a fan of Patrick Lincioni. Um, and, and probably my favorite book that we utilize here at Silverback is The Ideal Team Player. Um, so there's a, there's a, as part of that, there was a self-assessment, and we, uh, we utilize that with all of our employees. Humble, hungry, and smart. That's The Ideal Team Player. What's the biggest hurdle you've overcome in your business over the last year? The biggest hurdle I've overcome? Um, that's a good question, George. Um, let me think about that for a second. I think, again, it goes back to the perseverance piece. Sometimes people are not always open to ideas that we bring to them. And I think it's presenting those in a way 
that helps them achieve their objectives and also saves money? Can you send us out with a quote to help forge our listeners as leaders and entrepreneurs? Take the risk, always. Okay. I love it, Scott. This has been amazing. Uh, I think one of the more unique interviews I've done, again, I think that this is a story that really needs to get out. We need to have more people understand that there are more creative ways to, to manage costs and add to the top line as well. And I want to thank you very much for taking your time to, to talk to your audience today. One final question. Just want to make sure that our audience knows how to get in touch with you and Silverback. George, you can find us on the web at getsilverback.com. That's the easiest way. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking your time to share your knowledge and experience with our audience, Scott. Thank you. Thanks, George. Have a great one. 